Hello and uh, welcome to this presentation entitled Forward Contract Managing Counterparty Risk. In an earlier presentation we looked at a uh, forward contract between a farmer and a manufacturer who sought to protect themselves against adverse movements in the market price. But we came to appreciate that uh, they were still subject to counterparty risk. That is to say, what happens if during the life of the forward contract either the farmer or the manufacturer defaulted on their obligation? Well in this example what we're going to do is to look at how the two parties can protect themselves against counterparty default through the intervention of a third party referred to as the custodian. So just as a reminder, we have the farmer and the manufacturer who enter into a simple forward contract agree on a price of $100 per unit based upon 1,000 units. The farmer therefore sells forward at $100 and the manufacturer agrees to buy forward at $100. Now we see the intervention of the custodian. In this example, at the start of the forward contract, both the farmer and the manufacturer have to put up an initial sum of money with the custodian. In this case, it's $5 per unit. So, at the start of the forward contract, the contract is struck and the deposits are handed over to the custodian. Let's suppose now that over time we glance into the forward market and we see that forward contracts for the same settlement day are now trading at 104. What happens in this particular example is that on the appropriate date, the custodian of the, the farmer will collect $4 per unit from the farmer. The idea being this, that should, shortly after receipt of the $4, the farmer defaults on the forward contract, then this isn't going to be a problem for the manufacturer because the manufacturer, although admittedly has to go into the forward market now and take out a new forward contract, and is having to buy forward at 104 now, as opposed to the original price of 100, they are at least compensated the $4 from the custodian of the farmer. So therefore, the manufacturer hasn't been disadvantaged because they're simply taking out a new forward contract at 104, but being cash compensated $4 from the custodian of the defaulted farmer. However, in this example, let's suppose that neither party do default and we just move on along the timeline. Let's suppose now that the forward price for the same delivery day has changed to $98. That's a change of $6. What happens now is that $4 is returned from the custodian of the farmer to the farmer, but $2 is collected from the custodian of the manufacturer. The idea being that in this example, should the manufacturer default now, then the farmer would have to go into the market, take out a new forward contract with somebody else at $98, and there would be disadvantage $2. But the idea is that the $2 that's been collected from the custodian of the manufacturer would be transferred to the custodian of the farmer and therefore protect the interest of the farmer in such an event. Again though, let's suppose that neither default and we move along the timeline. This time the price rallies from $98 on a forward basis to $107. That's a $9 movement. Now look at what happens with respect to the cash flows held at the two custodians. Notice that the $2 is given back to the manufacturer and $7 is collected from the farmer. Now you can see the logic of this because once again, let's suppose that after these cash flows have been made, shortly afterwards the farmer defaults, then the manufacturer would have to go into the market, take out a new forward contract with somebody at 107, but we can see that $7 is held on retention by the custodian of the farmer and they would be obligated to transfer over in the event of a default that $7 to the custodian of the manufacturer. Therefore, the um, manufacturer wouldn't be disadvantaged in any way. However, let's suppose again that neither have defaulted and we continue with the example to um, the situation where the price goes to 115 that's a dollar movement of um, $8. Now let's suppose that actually on this occasion the farmer does default shortly after the receipt of that um, $8 sum. Now in reality when there is a default it may sometimes take a couple of days for the, uh, the other party to go into the marketplace and take out a new forward contract. Let's suppose having received the $8 into the custodian's hands from the, um, the farmer, 
news does break that the farmer um, defaults and it takes a couple of days in which to go into the market to replace the contract. Let's suppose that the replacement cost is not 115 but $118. What happens then? Well, we can see that the original $5 initial deposit can be used to help compensate during this uh, period. So, for example, the price from $115 to $118 is $3. Well, we can take $3 from the $5 initial margin along with the $7 and the $8 that had been paid through this variable transfer of cash over time. That money then, on the event of a default, would be transferred over to the custodian of the manufacturer. And therefore, the manufacturer wouldn't be disadvantaged in any way because if we add up 7 plus 8 plus 3, then that comes to $18. Now, of course, at this point, it would mean that the manufacturer would have to go into the market, take out a new contract at $118, and therefore we can see that the $18 compensation from the custodian of the farmer would make up the difference. So what we've seen here, then, is a mechanism through the use of two separate custodians showing how the manufacturer and the, the farmer can protect their interests in the event of a default. Now, the regularity with which you mark those positions to market, in other words, taking the price of 100 to 104 to 98 to 107, etc., the frequency with which you do that can be anything from every other week or every other month over the life of a full contract. The more regularly you do this, administratively, it does become more costly, but of course it reduces the negative effect of a default. In the next presentation, we're going to see how we can bring together this idea of marking to market on a more regular basis. And instead of having two separate custodians, we have one central custodian. In other words, one central counterparty. And we'll see that that forms the basis for exchange-based uh, clearing.